As most of you know, again, I'm Howard Callahan. I'm with the Maryland Department of Ag's Nutrient Management Program. I'm actually in a regional office in Easton and Talby County. My area of most days is Talbot, Queen Anne's, or Kent County. Um, not saying I don't go to other places in the state, but basically you as an operator, when you filed nutrient management plans once upon a time or even now, they come to my office. I track that database. When you get annual reports, they don't necessarily come from me, but it comes from the database that I've got. Uh, you send them back to me for this region. I capture, you know, at least the fact that you've submitted them and capture a little bit of data. And then they ultimately go to Annapolis and they're put in databases and things are aggregated from there. And then the bulk of my time, since I don't have anything else to do, um, is out doing what we call on-farm implementation reviews. So I've seen most of you. I see a lot of faces in here that have probably seen me at their table at least once. Um, basically trying to verify that you're following your plan and if not, guiding you in the direction you need to go to get there. So my presentation is one that was put together that's a little more than what we're going to go through today. So a few slides I'm going to jump through for the essence of time. But I have no problem if you have a question while we're going through that you ask because it's here for your benefit, not mine. I don't care if I don't get to the other side of the presentation. <clears throat> So just to bring things up, I'm going to focus on really two things, and that's the annual report and the PMT. Those are the two most prevalent things going on in today's world. Annual reports, um, just for a refresher, um, everybody should be getting one. If you've got a nutrient management plan on file, they're due March 1, so they're coming real quick. You heard Tony talk earlier about the, the one more reason that it's important to file them is, again, to be in compliance for cover crop payments, whatever else. But... Um, those reports have gotten more attention and they get more attention every year. But anyhow, last year, so a year ago, there were some actual legislative Senate bills and stuff that was passed, which basically required some changes, at least for annual reports, that I'm assuming most of you have seen at this point. And if you looked at it all, you said, hmm, things look different. Well, that's part, a lot, big part of that is because of this regulation that was changed. Um, and there were some other things in it to do with CAFOs and Department of Natural Resources, but again, I'm going to focus on the nutrient management portion. So again, the heart of that was to do with annual implementation reports, um, but now it requires the department to add more information to that by that legislative mandate for a report that has to go back to the governor at the end of the year. And it's basically tracking more on the amount of animal manure imported and exported from farm operations, for imported animal manure, the name and location of the sending farm has to be recorded if you're importing something to that. And I'll get to the form in a minute and we'll go through it a little bit more. But those are new things. And again, if you're exporting animal manure, it's again the name and location of the farm that manure was exported to or you sent it to an alternative use facility or you sent it through to a manure broker. Again, if animal manure is received, so if you're importing it through a broker, Again, the broker shall provide the operator with the name and the location of the sending farm. So that's been something that people are having some trouble with, and I can understand that when they weren't prepared. So if you imported manure through a broker in 2019, you as the farmer, when you do your annual report, I hate to say you can't, but you're not supposed to list your broker as who you got the manure from. You got to go to the broker and find out where it actually originated from, and you got to put that person's farm name and address of where it came from. So that's been a little bit of a challenge, but we're working through it. <clears throat> Again, in that same bill, there was. Uh, some penalties increase for not following annual reports because, again, it is valuable information that is getting used for a lot of purposes that is extremely important that we be getting them, I guess is what it comes down to. So, again, they're due March 1. If you don't do it by give or take a little to middle to end of March, you're going to get a warning letter first. It basically gives you opportunity, lets you know what's going on. But after that, um, warning letters, they can be fined, not less than 100 bucks, but up to 250 and they've, that's kind of been the standard for years. And now it says if it's more than 60 days, basically you can go up to 1,000. Um, again, you know, 90 days or after can be fined. Again, not less than 1,000. So these are built in for people that, I guess we'll use the word, are resistant. You know, it's not 90% of you, it's 2%. 
and there may not be any of you in this room, but there are some in the state, so they're, they're putting more teeth into it. Again, the consideration has to be given to the willfulness. In other words, it's one-time mistake. Y'all had a situation, we're not going to beat you to death, but if it's, we know you didn't do it last year, and we know you didn't do it the year before, pretty good chance you're going to get the $1,000 fine, so just be aware. Again, if you hold a certification, that's, in other words, a person that's writing plans or a license, in other words, you're talking about consultants, which aren't most of you in this room. Again, they've got some responsibilities under the PMT, the phosphorus management tool. They were required to submit basically their operator's soil test phosphorus levels in 2016, and they have to be done again in 2021. They put a little penalty into that. If they don't do that, now they're subject to a $250 fine. Key is data that we got to have. Uh, as far as implementation of plans, and this would be people that I went out and seen, and you're not following your plan, at least within the parameters or where we need to be, um, you're at this point, and I say continuing, and I don't see that changing, is you're given a warning the first time. So it's basically putting you on notice and says, this is a problem, this is what's got to change, here's your time frame to get it changed, I'll ultimately be back and make sure we understand. But if it turns into being continuous, I'll call it, so then it steps up to the next level and it becomes penalties. Uh, up to last year, penalties were a uh, maximum of $2,000 per year, now they're up to $5,000. Um, there is actually was added a minimum of a $250 fine for applying phosphorus to a regulated field that prohibits phosphorus. Again, that's circling around the PMT or phosphorus. Um, so those things are new. Again, consideration given to willfulness, the extent, you know, I don't see anything changing that's, if you're willing to work and willing to adapt, that it's going to be a problem. <clears throat> Again, additional reporting as far as that annual report and that regulation change was, again, exporting, importing manure, um, basically by geographical area, or at least we're tracking it by county. Um, so that, that is new. This basically is just to go through the picture or go through the, the form a little bit just to give you a visual. Again, I think most of you have probably seen it, but this is going to kind of point out the differences. Again, when we get down here, when I go to the next slide, anything that's red was a new word. Blue just means basically it's, a, it's something that's a management question that may have changed. So again, if you get your first page of your annual report, which again, they go out just like this year, they're bright green. This year you got four pages, what I call two pieces of paper front and back, where in the past you only had three, and that's because of the new questions. Well, the only thing new on that very first page was number 20. These things may have been rearranged, from where they were in the form before, but they're not new questions. So basically, number 20 just says, total acres of animal manure recommended for land application by your nutrient management plan. So it didn't say, this is what I put manure on, but this is how many acres in my plan did I have an option to put manure on. So that's a brand new question. That's basically the page two as a whole. These were things, again, on page two that... Uh, Got some maybe additions in their innovative or management type questions. These are questions and answers that are being used for measuring data for WIP compliance, watershed implementation plans, keeping the bay clean. You know, there's models and this, that, and this. So a lot of this information is what that is. So it's like, for an example, it says acres under conservation tillage that you had 30 to 59 percent residue when you plant it or you had greater than 60%. Acres under irrigation. Acres maybe where you did variable rate fertilizer. So you're gonna fill out what's relevant to you. If it's not relevant to you, skip it, put a blank over it, put a circle through it, whatever. But these are questions that are getting more and more importance for us having information. Again, on that same page, you know, this would have been new. Um, if you think about the annual report, it focuses on a calendar year. We don't farm in calendar years, but we rec will we'll say our report's in a calendar year. So the report that you was due March 1 is a reflection of 2019. So it starts on January 1 of 2019, and it ends on December 31st of 19. But you may do things, like for an example with manure down here on number 33, it's asking for tons of farm collected poultry litter that remained or stored remain stored or stockpiled from 2018. So this is trying to get a handle on manure that I had that I carried over from one year to the next and ultimately used. So again, 
This right here is a reflection of a person that's generating poultry litter. So again, the key would be they have chickens. So if you're importing, this doesn't apply to you. So you're just going to go through that, and you're going to go to the section that does. Think about it. We send one annual report to every operation, and they're all not the same, but you're going to fill out what's relevant to you and hopefully give us some inclination, if we think it's relative to you, that you either didn't have it, so put a zero, put an X, draw a line. We don't think you just skip through it. There are certain things we got to have and other things we can, we can work with. <clears throat> Again, um, so these blue would have been new, or I mean, were innovative management questions. Again, the red is new. So again, it's, for an example, acres manure applied to the crops at a phosphorus removal rate. That's not something that's real prevalent, but again, it's important as far as saying maybe a nutrient savings or a nutrient reduction. Then total on-farm collected manure in gallons or tons, total on-farm collected manure that remains stored or stockpile. Again, this is still focusing on an operation that's producing it. Not going to apply to a lot of you. <clears throat> Same thing down here. It says total imported manure that remains stored or stockpiled from 2018 was applied in 2019. So it's not uncommon for people using chicken litter, for an example, you may have imported chicken litter in the month of December of 2019 to ultimately have it for when March of 2020 comes. So in reality, you're going to report that on your 2019 annual report because you imported it during the calendar year, but you're basically going to say, I didn't use it, and it's going to show up on next year's annual report. So next year, this is going to say manure that came in in 2019 that was applied in 2020. So in this report for 19, we're trying to pick up manure that came in in 18 that ultimately got used in 19. Again, this is page three, and again, it's, it's in, a, in theory, page three is two questions. You got question 51 and question 52, but just to go, I'm gonna jump through, this is basically blowing up question number 51, so at least you can maybe hopefully see it. If you looked at this this year, you know, for people that are using manure, that's, this is brand new and something we never had in the past. So again, the top is if you're importing manure, biosolids, food waste, or other organics to your operation, basically anything that ain't commercial fertilizer, spent mushroom soil, whatever, they all fit in this category. So if you import it, if you didn't have any, check none. Very simple. We know you didn't forget the box. You just checked none in the corner. But if you import it, you got a list again. The name of the person or the name of the farm entity that I actually where it was actually generated, it's in a sense, is where it actually originated from. The street, the city, the county, the state, the zip. You check which type. If your type is not listed, check other, write it in there. And again, if you're doing poultry, it's going to be in tons. So you would say, I imported 500 tons poultry litter from Howard Callahan at this street address during 2019. So the first question is amount, how much tonnage did I bring in? Amount used may be one and the same. So if I imported it in 19 and use it in 19, it's going to be the same. But if I imported it in 19, but I haven't used it, so used might be a zero, which basically is implying it's still sitting there. And then if you did use it, how many acres did that product go on? So you got to do a different line from every source that you obtain manure from. I've seen some come through that have 10, 15, 20 sources on them. So ultimately, you got to make copies because this has only got room for three. And again, it's not something where you're supposed to be listing the broker. you got to go back to the broker and get information. I've also had people, because if you read this literally, it says uh, location where organics were imported. So you know, after I start seeing them and you know, your little brain goes off and you say, well, I can kind of see where they came that. So people are writing down where they put it. It's where it were imported, if you think about it. So that's not what we're looking for. It's where did it come from. So I think we've at least learned one thing, that at least next year we're going to put the word from after imported. So it will say imported from. I know if you read the directions, which 99.9% .9 of us never want to do, it tells you that. But So little things we're learning as we go. So again, it gives you a place to list three places, three different sources, three different types, gallons, tons, acres. That's brand new data. This is the second half of that. So if you're an exporter of nutrients, 
You're, so now it's the same type of thing, but it's now I have exported. So again, you're only going to export if you generate it. So if you didn't generate, you didn't export. You didn't have anything to export. So did I export manure, food waste, or other organics that left your farm operation? So again, name of person that you exported to. I think we've learned we're going to put a to there, just like we're going to put a from on the other one. So if I exported it to Howard Callahan, then Howard's name, address, what type, gallons or tons. And again, I sent it to, if it's Howard, another farmer, to a other farm operation. Or I sent it to Howard, the manure broker. Or I sent it to Howard, which has a mushroom facility, which is an alternative use. So again, we're trying to track where is it coming and going. Again, it gives you room for three different situations. You need more, you make another copy. That page basically is, to my knowledge, is identical to before. So again, it's nothing new. You list, you find your crop if you got it. You put your acres to pounds of commercial fertilizer, pounds of nutrients from manure, pound from sewage sludge, pound from something else. You sign it, you date it, you know, we're good to go. Again, if you're a CAFO, there's a few of you in this room, which basically means you're under a permit. Uh, generally speaking for poultry, there are some dairies under that also. Um, you get to basically a form that is almost identical, but not 100% identical. The major difference is at the top, you see two logos, Maryland Department of Ag, Maryland Department of Environment. Maryland Department of Environment regulates the CAFOs, but we get intertwined with that. And since they need an annual report, we need an annual report, they're combined. So it's basically the same report with a few additional questions that most of you would never see. But if you're a CAFO, you do have something that's a little bit different. If you were a CAFO, then you have to fill out this page, assuming you're using manure on your crops or on crops in your rotation, you got to give more details. Again, it doesn't apply to most of you. Uh, that was some proposed things, and it's just basically cleaning up some timing. It's really housekeeping stuff to me. It's not really prevalent to most of us. PMT is certainly a hot topic um, and has been for years, but we're getting closer and closer to what I call the implementation thereof. So PMT stands for Phosphorus Management Tool. It's in regulation, was passed in regulations back in 2015, basically has being phased in into our nutrient management regulations from 2015 ultimately until full implementation in 2022. So it's a drawn out process. So we're in year number five. So, but it really started in the year 2018. Again, everybody that, everybody that has phosphorus levels that are greater than 150 FIV, which may not be a lot of you, but if you have any of those within your plan, your nutrient management consultant should have signed you in, assigned you into a tier. You should be able to read right in your plan, and it says this farm is a tier A or a tier B or a tier C. And all that is is the implementation schedule that that operation has to follow as far as when and how you have to start implementing PMT because everybody doesn't follow the same rule in transition, which is now till 2022. I was talking about some stuff. In other words, there were some things a while back about uh, maybe extending the deadline. None of that's gonna happen. We're still on the same path we were five or six years ago. We're still 2022. PMT, you know, nothing has changed at this point. I did find out just last week that there is now another five-year study being conducted by the university um, on still evaluating PMT. So I'll go out on a limb and say there will be changes in the future, which there always has been. That change is inevitable. But today, we're working with what we got. So again, if you're in that, you're, you're basically your tier group was assigned by based on what I'll call the the how high are your phosphorus levels, if that's the right word? So it basically looked at any fields that you would have had that were 150 FIV or greater. So you may have only had one of them. Well, that one field is going to determine your tier group. If you got 10 that will meet that criteria, those 10 are going to determine your tier group or did determine it. So basically all it was was taking whatever those fields were, adding them all together, dividing by those number of fields, and then it says – my average of these five fields, 10 fields, one field was 189, for an example, then it puts you into a tier group. So the people with the highest tier group 
in theory, are going to have the biggest impact to their operation with PMT. So they start it sooner in a trickle-down weaning effect to get them to make changes. Tier C, which is the lowest group, is really coming online this year in 2020. So there's anticipation, like I was talked about earlier, there's anticipation that there's going to be possibly more manure that needs to be relocated this year, but it's almost inevitable it will be in the next few years. So we're kind of building up the momentum that we anticipate is coming because of these PMTs kicking in when it's applicable. Again, this is just a table of kind of that PMT in a nutshell. Again, if you were a tier C, which was above 450 FIV, so you were really high. See, they started in 2018. They transition one, transition one, then they go to transition two, transition two, we get to PMT. If you're tier B, then you were 300 to 450, then the same thing. You didn't start until 19, but you're all hidden. Tier A, I think I said C a while ago, it should have been tier A, actually is the group that is going to start transitioning 2020, so this year. And that actually 2020 season, I guess that's the right word for the nutrient management regulations, actually started in July 1 of 2019. So everything in 2020 will be under some sort of PMT. All the farms that met any of this criteria, and again, it's not, I'll go out on a, in a limb in this room and say there's less than 5% of you in here that this even applies to. That's what I'm saying. It's not a lot in this region. Go to other parts of the state, and there's 80% that it applies to. Those are the ones that manure probably is going to have to move from. Reality speaking, three lower shore counties in Maryland. I mean, there's other pockets, but that's the heart of where it's PMT is going to have the biggest impact because they're up here in this group. So the key is, again, 2022, assuming we're all still going to be here two years from now, still farming, we're all going to be following PMT to its full implementation value. Currently, we're in a transition. Phase one, phase two, full. Phase one and two are more lenient than PMT will be. The key to that is you know your operation. If you know you have any fields over 150 FIV, you need to be talking to your consultant and you need to be asking questions if they haven't already brought it up to your attention. If you don't have any fields that are over 150, this is all a mute point. It doesn't mean anything. But we're trying to educate you to say, here's some reasonings why other farmers are going to have to move manure that may to look to you as, an in, as, a, as a person to utilize it because you don't have the excessive levels. And if you have excessive levels, hopefully it's only 1 or 2 or 5% of your farm, and you can work with that. You know, it didn't cut me off at the knees. <clears throat> so just things to be aware of. Again, in PMT, so if we look ahead, ultimately under PMT, full PMT, 2022, Everybody that has a soil test of 150 FIV or greater will have some restriction. It's just a matter of to what extent. You will basically be, every, every field is evaluated by your consultant and you're put into, you're given a score based on your site conditions, your management, your soil test level, your amount of P. So a lot of factors go into this, backed by hopefully good science that says this field, this site, this condition, this situation um, scores in a low risk, a medium risk, or high risk. You just basically put into one of three categories based on your score. So if we're at, this is basically 2022. So if you come out and get a low risk based on your field, your situation, it's limited you to no more than three years worth of crop phosphorus removal in any single application. So what that means in a nutshell is you could say, well, I'm going to grow corn in year number one, and that's where I want to use my manure. So in that scenario, as long as you didn't go over crop anticipated phosphorus removal for this year and the two years following, which because we're going to make some judgment calls that says, well, this year I know I'm growing corn. Next year I think I'm growing beans, and the year after I think I'm going to grow corn again. So it's going to be a calculation to say, what do we anticipate phosphorus removal from those three crops cumulatively 
being over the next three years. And that's going to be your limit that basically says, let's just make easy math. Let's just say that adds up to be 150 pounds of phosphorus, 50 for each year, which is low, but we'll just use that number. You could put 150 pounds of phosphorus to the acre in year number one on your corn with the restriction, I can't put any phosphorus in year number two and year number three. So you got a restriction. Or you can say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to use half of it in year one on corn. I won't put any in year two on beans, and I'll put the other half in year three. So you get some choices as to when and how you want to apply that three years' worth of P. If you were a medium risk, you're limited to one year's crop removal. So now you don't get a lot of choices. You can go up to that limit. So this guy, in theory, is still going to do the same amount of P over three years, but he can't put, any, he can't put a cup full on year number one. He can only put a spoonful on year number one and a spoonful on year number two and a spoonful on three, number three because that site is considered riskier, so they're not going to let you put what I call extra phosphorus at any given time. And the key to all of that, again, if you get down here and if you're high risk, you see that? No additional P. That means zero from any source, anyhow, anywhere. That's only if you're high risk. Hopefully most of you, I'm confident most of us in here ain't going to be high risk, but there are farms that will be high or fields that will be on other parts of the state. But if transition, so if we now look at this backwards, so the people in 2020, they're going to start phase one, and you see if they're high risk, they still get to do one year's worth of crop removal. And then in phase two, they're going to wean them to half of it. And then in full, we'll call it phase three, there's zero. So it's a trickle-down effect. Most farms that I have encountered, most, generally are in the low-risk category. So they're somewhere in here. And in reality, they're doing the same thing in transition that they can do in the future. Other than in transition, if this person was doing three-year crop removal, they can do three years' worth of crop removal in year number one in transition. And they can do three-year crop removal again in year number two in transition. And then do, you know, but when you get to full, it's going to restrict you over that three-year rotation. So there is some changes. So impacts are going to increase as time increases based on this philosophy. So it's just things to be aware of. But again, most of you, this is not applicable to sitting in this room, I can tell you. The key is you know what you got. Talk to your consultant. Be aware of what I can do today. But what, if any, restrictions will there be between today and two years from now that I may have to adapt? Basically, this is a technical user's guide. It's where all the data comes from. It's available. Anybody certainly can go look at it. It's an extension bulletin, but that's what we use. That's what the plan writers use. This is talking about setbacks. That's nothing new. If you need a nutrient application setback, again, it's in your plan. Um, as most of us know, we're not supposed to be applying, generally speaking, any nutrients, including manure, from December the 16th through February the 28th. But we do have emergency situations, generally speaking, when it's just something to do with a liquid like a dairy with a lagoon. And if we have emergencies, we just need to be aware. We work with you. We try to get through that. Um, but my, my foresight sees that it's getting to be more of an issue. It's like we're they're, – they're, we can deal with true emergencies, but we can't do, we can, we're having trouble dealing with what I call lack of planning, as in, well, I didn't get it done. So it's December the 16th. That's an emergency. Well, I understand you got an emergency today, but you got to plan better in the future and don't go do whatever you should have been doing on November the 15th and spreading your manure um, instead of waiting until asking for an emergency. So there is allowances, but we don't want to take advantage of it or it's going to get shut down. Again, that's talking about emergency spreading. Um, some policy changes, really nothing. I think Tony talked about this earlier. Again, if you're doing anything with max cost share, you got that certification form. Looks kind of like that. That basically you, your consultant, fill out. You take that to the district. It's what's used to measure. Uh, what's one tool that's used to measure that you have a current plan? They're also looking at us to make sure we don't have any compliance issues with nutrient management, which would be your annual report or a violation from something else that we can't get corrected. There are other issues. So, um, And this was something that was developed a few years ago. 
because we don't have current plans with everybody because you file your first and only plan. So then after that, we just see annual reports. So we can't really see what you have. And we necessarily don't always want to see because if we ain't careful, there's what's called a Freedom of Information Act. And then people want to see your information. So thank God our stuff is protected at this point. But the less we have, in theory, the better. It's kind of some cases. but So again, my contact information, don't ever hesitate to call, email. I'll try to help you. When I come out to see you, again, I know you don't think I'm there to help you, but <laughs> I, that, my ultimate goal was to help make sure you're doing what needs to be done and point you in a direction if it isn't satisfactory. Anybody got any questions, any heartburns? No, if they did, they ain't sent them in. <laughs> yes. So I think I guess this question is when if if Dicky imports manure from me and I give Dicky an analysis of it. I'm responsible in theory to give you an analysis, but you are responsible as the user to make sure it's legitimate, if that makes sense. And and I'll use the word I'll use the word, you use your own judgment, buyer beware. Just because you think that's what you got don't mean that's what you got. And if you suspect anything different, I would get another sample. That's correct. But you don't know that the man who put it in the bag gave you a legitimate sample. <laughs> that, so as long as, from our perspective, as long as it's current, as in, you know, like a year old or less, we're good with it. But... You, as the producer, want to have assurance that if I'm getting 80 pounds of phosphorus, that I got 80 pounds of phosphorus or 40 pounds of nitrogen. So we, I, I see forms that have come in this year, and I mean, I, some capable, capable of realizing that this is not right, and I usually just make a phone call or send an email and try to get it corrected. Some cases, I'm sure it's came in, and I didn't pick up on the fact that it was wrong. Um, so it's not the end of the world, but in reality, if you imported manure, it's looking for the address where that manure, in theory, was generated. So that's, that's the key. So importers got to have specifics. Exporter can say, I went to a broker. Part of this, and I wasn't involved, but when this regulation was drafted and was being going through hearings at the beginning, it didn't look like this. Um, it actually had a requirement that brokers we're going to have to be registered, file paperwork, do what I'll call an annual report. That they were going to have to report where manure was coming and going. And I'll use the word in negotiations. Don't want to point fingers at too many people. But it was decided that, no, we don't need to do that. Farmers take care of that. So it got added to your annual report. So good, bad, or indifferent. Maybe another reason to be involved with Farm Bureau. Um, to those are the type of people that are speaking for you when they're sitting at the table and it's Farm Bureau and it's the environmentalists and it's the legislature and it's whoever else that says, I want this. And you got to say, well, we can't do that. And here's why. But we will do this. So my history has been, or experience has been, that's what happens all the time. You start here and you end up here and it don't suit everybody, but it suited the majority, if that's the right word. Thanks, Howard. Come on. Uh, like Jenny said, uh, I'm, my name is Tyler Marchek. I'm with Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit in the Chestertown office. Um, if you're not familiar with Farm Credit, we're a premier ag lender. Uh, anywhere from farm loans, land loans, home construction, rural home loans, you name it, we can pretty much do it. Um, it's a big time of year. Everybody's getting their uh, renewals and, and, and making sure you're getting your farm operations underway. If you have any questions about anything that you have currently with your mortgage rates or, or operating lines, definitely stop by and see us. We have a booth and several loan officers out there. Um, also, if you're a current member of Farm Credit, uh, late March into April, you'll start receiving those nice patronage checks uh, that come in the mail every year, and you'll start seeing those again as well. Uh, but like I said, we're here all day, and if you have any questions, definitely stop by and see us, and we appreciate uh, everything you guys do for us. So congratulations, and uh, good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Logan Field. 
I'm from uh, Growmark FS in Sellersville. Uh, we are a full service ag retailer offering fertilizer, seed, and chemistry. Um, we also have a division of precision agriculture called My Field, which offers um, zone sampling. Um, we have imagery, um, satellite imagery, infrared imagery. We use drones to take imagery as well. So um, we pretty much have everything. If you're looking for a new ag retailer, um, come visit us. We have a booth outside as well. Thank you. Hello, guys and women. <laughs> My name is Burl Jastrom, and uh, I'm with LG Seeds. Uh, LG Seeds uh, offers corn, soybeans, sorghum, and alfalfa. Um, LG Seeds is owned by AgriLiant Genetics, uh, one of four of the major um, genetic germplasm holders of corn in the world. So if you want to see some different genetics in your fields, see us. We have a booth outside.